What's that? Is that there? Okay, perfect. That works. All right. Are we good? Okay, excellent. So away we go. Um, my name is Ian Walker. I'm the director of admissions for the medical school. Can I turn this down a little bit? Just, okay, perfect, thanks. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. I just wanted to introduce, before we start, April Gustafson, who is uh, essentially the life and soul of the admissions office. Uh, those of you who have been doing this for a while might remember Adele Myers. Uh, Adele has now taken her long-earned uh, retirement, and uh, yeah, and we're sad. And uh, April has taken over that role. April's been in the admissions office for the last nine years, knows the system like the back of her hand, probably better than I do. Uh, and so if you call the office looking for information, that's who you are going to be talking to. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the admissions process generally. Sorry, I just need to get my little clicker thing. And this is being recorded so that it will be available for online for reference purposes and for other people. Before we start, I just wanted to show you a little bit of data, if you will about the admissions process, you can get a sense for sort of people always have these questions about, you know, what are my chances, how are things, you know, how many applicants do you have, all that sort of thing. So a little bit on the numbers. So this was last year, this was our applicant cohort 2016. So we number, number our cohorts by the end of the cycle. So you are the 20, if you're applying this year, the, the 2017 cohort. And if you look at this graph, what it basically does is it shows you what happens to the applicants by and large. So a little over half the applicants apply, don't get interviewed. That's the end of the road for them. Another chunk of applicants get interviewed, don't get offered. About 10%, maybe 11% ultimately wind up accepting our offer and joining the medical school. Another five or 6% get offered, choose to go elsewhere or choose to do other things with their lives, which is okay. And then about 1% or 2% annually will defer their acceptance to go and do something else for a year before they come back and join the medical school. What I really wanted to point out to you are those little slices in red. So those are the people who waste their time and donate $150 to the University of Calgary. So those are the people that don't release their MCAT scores, don't go on the AAMC website and release their MCAT scores to us, or don't get their transcripts here on time. So they do all this work. Last year there were over 60 of them. They do all this work, they get all these letters of reference, they pour however many hours into their application, and we never even look at it. Because they don't do those things. So the first sort of take home point for the night, if you will, is that if you don't release your MCAT scores and you don't get your transcripts here on time, everything else is a waste of time, okay? You have about five weeks to the application deadline now. There is absolutely no reason your transcripts shouldn't already be on our desk, or given the impending postal strike, that they shouldn't be on their way. We talked a little bit about the postal strike earlier, April and I. That is not going to be an acceptable reason for not getting your transcripts in. It sucks, it's unfortunate, but I would say to you, if your transcripts are not already been sent, then I would encourage you to use a, a courier service to get them to us. We have gotten a few little notifications from some institutions saying, you know, due to the impending uh, postal strike, we trust that you will accept uh, this faxed copy of the transcript. They can trust all they want. We're not going to take faxed copies, right? We need original notarized copies that we know exactly where they come from and they are in a sealed envelope and all that jazz, right? So make sure those transcripts are on their way. A little bit about our application process, right? So really the application process is two stages. There's a file review and there's an interview. The file review stage is the part that we use all that data that you, punt, you pile into the UCAN application for us. We look at your GPA, which is calculated, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's calculated. 
we look at your MCAT scores, particularly the CARS, or the Critical Analysis and Reasoning Skills section of the MCAT, plays a, a prominent role. And then we have what we call the non-academic or non-cognitive attributes that our file reviewers, members of our file review subcommittee, score on the application. And they, they attach a numerical score. It's a bit reductionistic, right, to try and reduce a person and all their depth and all the things they've done, which we're trying to suss out, to a number. But at the end of the day, we have to have a system that allows us to make decisions and that allows us to make decisions in a justifiable um, and defensible manner. So we do that. We're not thrilled about it, but nobody's come up with a better way yet. And you can see that breakdown there. So basically, your GPA counts for 20%. It's the biggest thing. Everything else counts for 10%. The other way to look at it is academic markers, GPA, MCAT, and this subjective evaluation of academic merit or holistic evaluation of academic merit makes up 10%. So the academic piece is 40%. The non-academic piece is 60%. Those scores are tallied up. It takes us about three months to get it all done, probably. Two and a half to three months after you submit your applications. We line up the applicants from 1 to 1,500 or 1,600 or whatever the lowest number, you know, the, the total number is. Highest score at the top, lowest score on the bottom. We determine how many interview spots we're going to have that year, and we make that many offers for interview. We tweak it a little bit in the sense that we don't want to fill up our interview slots with people who are from out of province entirely. So we try to keep it roughly proportional, somewhere in the 15 to 20% range of the interview spots will go to people from outside the province. Not flexes a little bit from year to year depending on the total scores that have been obtained by the different people in the different groups. Is that a fair description, do you think? You're going to notice over the course of the evening that I keep looking to April for confirmation. And she's going to like give me a, a gasp look if I say something wholly, horribly wrong. All right, so a little bit on GPA calculations. So this hasn't changed much in the last several years. Basically, what happens is in order to be eligible, you have to have two full-time years at an undergraduate institution, and we'll talk what that means in a second, where you've done 24 credits between September 1st and April 30th, i.e. in one academic year. Okay? Of those 24 credits, 18 of them have to have a grade. Right? Three quarters of your courses can't be pass-fail. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. We're trying to predict your potential to succeed in a full-time academic program. The best predictor of that is how you've done in a full-time academic program before that. So if we've only got one course grade or two course grades to go on, it really doesn't give us much to make that decision on. So you have to have at least 18 credits that are graded. Um, so, if you've got that, then what we do is we calculate your GPA based on full-time years. That becomes our unit of measurement. Every full-time year counts, as the, counts the same in the calculus. So if you've done 24 credits one year and 32 credits another year and 30 credits another year, they all count the same. We basically calculate a GPA for each year, we add them up, and we divide by the number of years. So your composite GPA on your transcript from your university will be different, probably, than the GPA that we calculate in our system, unless it's 4.0. Because your composite GPA on your transcript is going to include summer courses. It's going to more heavily weight years in which you did 33 credits versus years in which you did 27 credits. But our, so ours is going to be a little bit different. So that's our basic way of doing things. Then there's a few modifications to that. So if you've got a degree or you're about to get a degree this year, you check a little box, and then the system actually kicks out your lowest year. So if you've actually got a degree, we reward that by basically giving you a mulligan. So you can look at it and say, yeah, that year I 
My transition year from high school, I drank a little too much, I partied a little too hard, my cat died that summer, whatever it is, because we got tired of evaluating people's pleas, you know, saying, oh, well, this thing happened to me, it's not our job, everybody gets a pass. If you got a 3.9 every year, it doesn't matter, right? But if you have one year, you really, something happened and you didn't do well, you can take that, you can take that year out of the calculus. The other part is that you can use a graduate degree, the entire degree, so all the coursework done within that single degree, as equivalent to one year of undergrad. So if you've got a master's degree, we take your GPA from your master's degree and use that as another year in the calculus. If you've got a master's degree and a PhD, we take your master's GPA, add that as a year, take your PhD GPA, add that in as another year. But at the end of the day, you still have to have those two undergraduate years. Okay? Feel free to jump in and ask questions anywhere along the way if you want to. We have a mic, though. We're going to ask you to ask the questions in the mic so they're recorded for everybody to hear. Then the last little... So, and the one thing I should say about that graduate thing, there has been one small change to our process this year, and we got the feedback loud and clear over the last several years. We used to say you had to have your degree in your hand your graduate degree. You actually had to have matriculated, had graduated, have convocated, have the degree. Now it's the same as the undergrads. If you have the degree or you are going to have the degree by the end of the application cycle, i.e. June, then that GPA counts. Okay? We will go back and check, though, if you've checked that box, we will require proof that the degree was actually conferred by the end of the year. And if it wasn't, we will go back and recalculate your GPA. So if you check the box, say, I'm going to graduate this year. Turns out you don't graduate the GPA that year. We go back, recalculate your GPA, and suddenly your application score drops below what was required to get an interview. Your interview will become void. Right? We go back and retrospectively pretend that you have this new calculated GPA, and everything flows from that. I'll give you an example. We had one student this year who actually that happened to, unexpectedly didn't finish his degree. We recalculated his GPA. A week after I sent the letter of offers out, I had to send him another letter saying, sorry, you are now on the wait list. Because his GPA had dropped, and consequently his place in the rank dropped about 30 or 40 places. He ultimately got in, but I think he had a pretty stressful few weeks. So only check that box if you're quite confident that you are going to get that degree by year end. Okay? Then the last thing that's worth mentioning is we do have this thing called a 10-year exclusion rule. So a number of years ago, the committee recognized that some people go off to university when they're young. They don't know what they're going to do. They kind of play around a little bit. They're not really focused. They don't really want to be there. Consequently, they don't do terribly well or they do okay but not great. And that that's not necessarily reflective of their actual academic ability. And so we invoke this thing called the 10-year exclusion rule, which allows applicants to elect to eliminate from the GPA calculation everything that's older than 10 years. You still have to enter it into UCAN. Your reviewers will still see it on your transcripts, but it doesn't go into your actual GPA calculation. The catch with that is that it's not selective, Right? You can't eliminate your year from 12 years ago and your year from 14 years ago, but keep the one from 13 years ago where you did well. And the other catch is that you then have to qualify based on what you've done in the last 10 years. So if you did your undergrad, 12, you know, finish your undergrad 11 years ago, you invoke the 10-year exclusion rule, you take your undergrad out, in the meantime, all you've done is your master's and your PhD. You do no longer have two full-time years of undergraduate study to be eligible. So you check that box, and suddenly the system says, you're not even eligible to apply. So you really have to think carefully about whether you want to invoke that rule. That said, we have a few dozen every year for whom that applies, and it gives them a certain advantage. Is that, about, is that fair? Okay. All right. So. MCAT. So we require the MCAT 2015, the new test. We required it last year? Yes. Sure. 
Sure. I was going to come back to that. You know what? I'm going to come back to that. OK? Fair enough. Um, so the MCAT, we require the MCAT 2015. The University of Alberta also requires the MCAT 2015. Your file reviewers, the people who look at your file, will see your old MCATs if you've written the old test, but they don't go into the calculus. They don't go into the numerical numbers for the MCAT. That is strictly based on the CARS section. So you have to write the new test. Okay? In a couple of years, it won't matter. Everybody will be writing the new test. You'll find that there's a, couple of, a few schools this year that are starting to transition. By next year, most will transition. And by two years from now, pretty much every school in North America is going to be new test only. Anybody here written the new test yet? It's a bit of a marathon. Okay? Anybody who's written the old one and the new one will notice there's a bit of a difference. So this is what our file reviewers will see when they open up your file. This is what our download looks like from the AAMC. So what you'll see here is that we get your old test. So when we look at your file, I mean, this gives you an idea of what the file reviewers see. You get all these little tabs, and they go through, and these are all the things that you've entered in there. But you'll see that before January 31st, 2015, so that's the old test. So we see how many times you've written the test. We see all your scores. We see percentile ranks for those scores, so how you compare it to the applicant pool generally. And then the same thing for the new test. And then we flag the one that actually got used in the calculus, right, for the 10%. So what this does is that if you've taken the test eight times in order to get a CAR score that's satisfactory to you, your file reviewers see that. And they see your low scores too. Right? So it's not really about your best score, it's about all your scores. But we do give you the benefit of the doubt and allow you to use your best score for the 10%. Okay? So there's a reason why we focus on the cars. There's a couple of schools in the country that do. It's, basically, it's mostly based on this data. So if you look at how the, this is old test data using what used to be called the verbal reasoning, which is the closest parallel to the CARS section. And in fact, when we look at our students who've taken both tests, the correlations are actually pretty good between the two scores. But if you look at the correlations between the subsections of the MCAT and markers of successful completion of the program, so LMCC, so medical licensing exams, clerkship exams, first and second year uh, medical school exams. The correlations with the science components of the MCATs actually get weaker as you get further and further into your medical training. The correlation between the verbal reasoning, and we expect by extension the CARS section, although that remains to be seen, actually gets stronger as you get further and further into your clinical, into your clinical life. The thought there is that the CARS section is a better predictor of clinical reasoning skills and actual on-the-ground practice of medicine skills than test-taking skills and book knowledge skills. Our problem is not producing people who can successfully complete the medical school courses in the first two years. Our problem is finding people who are going to be exceptional clinicians. And so that's why we put the focus on the CARS section. We also do care about the rest of it, though. And there's very good data out there that tells us that the lower your, car, your MCAT score, the higher the likelihood is that you're going to get into academic trouble in medical school. So again, this was from the old test. But as you started getting down around here, remember our average MCAT scores in our students using the old test was between 30 and 32. Right? The lowest we would accept might be when I had the odd person who was down around a 16, 17, 18, so an average of six. And they define difficulty as either not graduating, repeating a year, or failing multiple courses. So I'd say that's a reasonable definition of difficulty, right? As we get into those lower MCAT scores, as an applicant, you essentially become higher risk for us, right? You pose a greater risk to the institution that we're going to spend all this money and expend all this energy on you, and you might not actually finish. And conversely, 
a greater risk to, uh, sort of on the flip side of that is that a greater risk to yourselves, right? That you're going to accrue all this debt and then not finish and not have a way to pay it back. So we take that pretty seriously. That's not to say that we don't take people at the lower end of the MCATs range. We do, and we have, and we have gotten them through school successfully, but they, we know that we are taking a bit of a risk, right? So there better be something about them that shines brightly that tells us that, yes, that risk is worth taking, right? And we do it with our eyes open. All right, so that's your numerical part of your file review. And then we go to the subjective part. So the subjective part, or we can call it the holistic part if you want, is done by the members of our file review subcommittee. So our file review subcommittee consists of about 50 people, is that about right? About 50 people who review all the files. Each file is reviewed by four people. As far as we know, that's the most of any school in, North, in Canada by a significant margin. We have four groups of people on our file review committee. We have faculty members, we have medical students and residents, we have members of the general public, so public volunteers, patient advocates, that sort of thing, and we have members of the allied healthcare professions, so nurses, physiotherapists, podiatrists, uh, pharmacists, social workers, respiratory therapists, all those sorts of people. The people that I think of as, as the people who have to put up with doctors for a living, right? So they have, I think, a very good sense of what they're looking for in a good medical student. Each of those four people, each applicant will get assigned one person from each group to review their application. Occasionally, we have to violate that a little bit if we're a little short on bodies. Sometimes it's, you might get reviewed by two people from the same subgroup. Not sure it makes much difference, but that's the goal is to get one from each. You get that sort of breadth of perspective. And they go through and they review your file and they assign a score to each of seven different categories. The first one is this thing we call the subjective of assessment of academic merit. So basically, the question we are asking the applicants, the, the assessors to, to score is, what is the extent to which you are convinced that this person has the academic chops to handle the material? You know, somebody once described, I think quite aptly, uh, studying me, you know, medical school as drinking from the fire hose. It is fast, it is furious, there is a huge mountain of material and it's, not a, it's no mean task. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna look at your file and they're gonna look at your grades, they're gonna look at your MCAT scores, they're gonna look at your best MCAT scores, they're gonna look at your worst MCAT scores, but they're gonna look at, I think, a lot of other nuanced things. What is the trend over time? Are you getting better as you go on? Or are you getting worse? What's your course selection like? Nothing stands out to a reviewer more than somebody who suddenly in their third year of university, right before they apply to medical school, takes a whole bunch of introductory level courses and a whole bunch of unrelated disciplines. Similarly, they're gonna notice when you're taking senior seminars in your second and third year. They're gonna look at context. Are you employed at the time? Are you living at home? Are you living away from home? What's the rest of what's going on in the rest of your life? Right? So if you are employed, doing well academically, working 15, 20 hours a week because you have to to support yourself, the assessors are going to take that into consideration. They're going to take that into the context. Okay? The what is your program thing, I think, is a little bit interesting. And it's, you know, it's, we don't have a preferred program. We do recognize, however, that you know, students in engineering who are taking 36 credits a year probably are working a little harder than people who are taking 24 credits a year in another program. So they acknowledge that. Okay. The other six things that the file reviewers look at are taken from what we call, from what we call the CanMeds competencies, which are kind of wedded to what the the terminal objectives of the MD program, so what the MD program is aiming to produce. And 
they are, you can see them on this flower, and we'll go through them one at a time, but these are basically the non-academic attributes that we think, and pretty much society thinks, physicians should have at their disposal. So, like anything else, we can train you to do most things, but why would we not select people who have already well-developed the things that we are looking for, right? Picking a hockey team, why would you not pick people who can already skate, right? So the part of this was a bit of, this was also a bit of a transition for us, so about five years ago, and you'll notice that some other schools will talk about your achievements, right? And what we've chosen to do is focus not so much on your achievements, but on the attributes that underpin them. Part of that is a desire to assess the thing that we care about directly, not through a surrogate measure like your achievements. Because your achievements in life are partly about who you are and the attributes you, are, you have, but they also say something about the opportunities that you have been given, right? When they look at people who have performed in the Olympics, for instance, they overwhelmingly come from a higher socioeconomic demographic than the population at a whole, right? So it's, yes, they've shown tons of great resilience and tons of great attributes. Those people are, in many ways, exceptional people. They've also had exceptional opportunity. And we are not particularly interested in scoring or evaluating the opportunities that you've been given in life, but rather who you are, how you function, and how, what makes you tick. So here's a good example. Not that I have anything against Andre de Grasse. But when you look at somebody who has meddled in the Olympics, and God knows we've had several medical students over the years who fall into that demographic. It is very easy to look at that and go, wow, that is really, really impressive, right? And you just sort of give them lots of points for that. It's almost instinctive. But when you really cone down into it, you sort of wonder, what are you actually scoring? Because other than running to a code, there is no sprinting in medicine, right? How fast you run probably doesn't matter. What really matters is the other stuff that you've demonstrated through that accomplishment, right? Perseverance, resilience, self-confidence, the ability to overcome adversity, recognize your own limitations, those sorts of things. And what our committee has done is they've looked at that and said, okay, you can manifest those things through things like athletics and achievements in those, regard, in those sorts of endeavors. But you can also manifest those exact same attributes in less commonly thought of ways, right? So think about, in contrast, the person who immigrated to Canada at 14 years of age and taught themselves English while going to high school and working part-time in their parents' restaurant. That person has probably also developed a lot of those same attributes that we care about. So when you're thinking about what you're putting in your application, know that our committee is interested in hearing those stories, right? And the things that may appear to the naked eye to be kind of banal, run-of-the-mill, humdrum, might actually be the things that really matter to you and therefore matter to the committee. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's really my take home point. The same attributes, which is what we're scoring, are gonna manifest differently in different people, right? So it's not a question of looking at somebody saying, oh look, at, you know, this person was the president of that club, how could I ever compare to them, right? Well, what have you done in your life, in your context, in your situation, that has allowed you to develop those same attributes? So, we think about the six, so communication skills is the first one. It's a bit of a tough thing to evaluate. Part of it's written, right? What's in your application? What's the grammar like? What's the language like? That kind of thing. What do people say about you in their letters of reference? And what sort of activities have you done that involve communication, right? That, that we can see, that we can allow 
us to imagine that you have developed some communication skills. And that includes intergenerational communication and transcultural communication. Right? These will all be posted online, so you don't have to madly make notes. Interpersonal skills and collaboration is the second one. I think of this one as how well does the applicant play in the sandbox with others? Right? Are you part of a team? Do you function in teamwork environments? Do you contribute? Yes, we have lots of people who've shown great leadership ability in medicine, but everybody can't be president. Right? And sometimes the people who contribute the most are the people who lead from behind. Right? The early adopters, the early followers, the contributors, the sort of non-limelight seeking contributors. We want to value those things. Maturity and insight we used, is a replacement for a category we used to call professionalism and ethics, because that maps onto the CanMed's competencies. Our file reviewers kept saying to us that professionalism was very hard to evaluate in people who were not yet in the profession, and that problems with professionalism were exceedingly rare, so you know, everybody got an eight except for the one person you know, whose letter of reference said, yeah, this person falsified their data. OK, thank you very much. Right? Everybody else did well. So we changed this category and called it insight and maturity. And I, I don't know that that necessarily needs a lot of explanations, but it's really about what you say, how you present yourself, how you reflect on things. Commitment to community as an advocacy is yet another category. So this is really about your engagement with the world around you, right? Medicine is many things, but at the end of the day, it is still a service-based profession. It's not to say it's the only thing about it that matters, but there is a service component. If you have never really demonstrated an interest in serving the communities that you live in, what's to make us think that you suddenly are interested in doing it now? Right? And that definition of commu community can be broad. So it can be a physical community. It can be a cultural community. It can be a cause. Right? But show us that you care about something beyond yourself. And that you've done something to make the world or make some of the people in it a better place. OK? We are interested in duration of commitment. right? It is very transparent. When six months before applying to medical school, you suddenly volunteer with four different community organizations that are completely unrelated to each other. Right? That is obvious. Right? What we want to see is that you care about something. You have a cause. You have a passion. You have something that you do, that you live for. People will often describe multiple involvements with multiple organizations around a theme. Women's health, domestic violence, politics, student politics, whatever it is. But that's become their thing. And there's a longitudinality to it that speaks volumes. Right? It's not just about, in fact, it's entirely not about checking off the box. Oh, yes, I did that. Right? I, oh, yes, I did some volunteering. Oh, yes, I worked in the lab. Right? It's about you manifesting who you are and showing that to the committee so they can see it. On this front, I would just make my observation that this does not mean that you need to go and work in a developing nation for six weeks in a summer sometime. I had this wonderful experience a number of years ago. I'd been in the job for about two or three years. I was flying somewhere. I can't remember where anymore. And I was sitting in the departure lounge you know, in those seats that are kind of they go back to each other. And so I was just sitting there working away. And th these two young ladies sit down behind me. And they're, they start talking. It becomes quickly obvious that they're going to or applying to medical school or getting ready to apply to medical school. And one of them says, you know, to the other one, I'll tell you what you need to do to get into medical school. And I thought, hmm, this is going to be interesting. So I sort of perked up. And she laid out the, the formula for success. She said, you need to work in a lab, 
you need to volunteer overseas, and you need to start a club so you can be president. Which was the exact opposite of what we are trying to do in terms of checking off the boxes. There is nothing wrong with working overseas. Don't get me wrong. Okay? But at the same time, working, taking a summer off and working overseas is a privilege that is not open to everyone. If I were to take a whole bunch of 24-year-olds and say, how many of you, if I could pay for school for you next year, would like to go to Costa Rica and work in an orphanage for the summer? I will bet you that 90% of them will say yes. So the fact that you did it, if you did it, doesn't so much tell me much about your motivation as it does about the opportunities that you were afforded. Right? So it's about more than going to Costa Rica for six weeks. It's about actually being engaged. So yes, you did that. That's great. How do you reflect about it? What have you done since you've been back? Did you go back a second time? Did you do more than just the sort of volunteerism bit? Right? We also recognize that a lot of companies out there are making a lot of money off of medical, you know, medical school applicants by convincing them that they need this as part of their application process. You absolutely don't. We want to see you committed to your community. We want to see you giving back. We want to see you doing things. There are plenty of places to do that right here in Calgary. Okay? Yes? So, so the question is, how do you list all your volunteer activity on your, on your application? So the reason we, we went with a top 10 is that we used to have 30. We used to be able to put in up to 30 things. And so people felt compelled to put in 30 things, right? So it'd be like 28, you know. I took care of my neighbor's dog when they were on vacation. 29, I gave blood last year. Right? I, I'm not kidding, actually. I saw those things. Um, and what our, our assessors told us is that, you know, I stopped caring after about seven or eight. And when I think about the things, you know, with the top ten, what we're really trying to do is allow you the opportunity to, to talk about the experiences or the influences or the things in your life that make you who you are. And when I think about, even at, at 47 years of age, if somebody asked me to list the things that have been most influential in my life, I would be hard-pressed to get to 10. So it's not so much about listing off all the volunteer activities you've done as giving your assessor a sense of what you care about, right? So if all your activities are completely unrelated, right, and all these different things, and they're all like three months long, and there's 30 of them, really give the assessor much of a sense anyway. I mean, I suppose you could put, you know, volunteering in my community and just sort of describe the large breadth of different experiences that you've had. What most people do is they'll have volunteered for similar things or in similar domains um, across a number of, and they'll collapse those down, right? So they'll say, you know, one of my top 10 would be, um, you know, working in student government. And then they talk about, Something they did, in, you know, what they might have done in high school and undergrad, and and so forth. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, would you list all the verifiers uh, for a top ten that has multiple different different um, uh, subsets, subsections, or whatever? Um, the real, I think, what we ask you to do is to pick the one that's most prominent. List a verifier for that. If we're not happy, we will just come to you looking for more information. Right? What's that? I think you would, but then in your description, I think you really, so if your dates, sorry, I repeat the question here because I'm on mic. Um, if you're putting together activities, one of which was two years ago and one of which was just now, you know, what do you do for your start and your end dates? Yes, put the start and end, you know, put the early ones start date and the later ones end date. But I think in the description, you want to be really clear about the limitations of those dates. Because a few people have gotten tripped up 
um, when they've been perceived to be trying to give the impression that they did a lot more than they actually did. Right? So we have had plenty of people over the years who sort of said, oh, I volunteered at the hospital from you know, June of 2012 to July of 2016. And so we call the verifier, and the verifier sends us a little volunteer printout, and it's like four hours here, you know, four hours a week for about three months, and then a year hiatus, and a couple of shifts, and then a year and a half hiatus, and a couple of more shifts, that can burn you. So if that's your situation, that's fine, just be explicit about it. Just say, you know, over this period of time, I volunteered a total of about, you know, four hours a, a week, on average, for about six weeks, spread out over three years. That's fine, we just want you to be honest, right? We're very sensitive to people who appear to be misrepresenting themselves. And if we're not satisfied with the, the, uh, the verifier you've given us, we'll call you or email you and ask you for another one. Is that fair? Uh, organizational skills and management, and really you could call this leadership, um, is really about project completion, leadership roles, taking the initiative, focus, you know, goal focusedness, seeing things through to the, com to the completion, the achievement of the goal. Right? Also important. And then the last, I think this is the last one. So scholarship and research is a bit of a tricky one. People look at that and think, oh, that's just research, so if I've done a summer in a lab or I've got a PhD, woohoo. Again, it's contextual, right? So what that means for somebody who's 21 and in their third year of undergrad is very different from what that means for somebody who's 31 who's doing their second postdoctoral fellowship, right? Certainly this will be, an, this will be a strength for the latter person but at the same time, the expectations will be higher, right? So if you've got two master's degrees and no publications, no research, no presentations out of them, that's probably not going to impress anybody compared to somebody who's in their fourth year of undergrad and has actually done a presentation and actually you know, got second or third author on a published publication. It's also about more than research. It's about being scholarly, right? So being about the dissemination of knowledge and education and lifelong learning, which are those are the things that we care about as physicians. So we're thinking about things like peer mentorship, teaching, teaching assistance, assistance ship jobs, um, and general senses of intellectual curiosity. This is where the assessors actually look through your course selection. You know, one of the things that often jumps out at people is people who have, clearly have second, secondary interests, things that kind of intrigue them. And they've pursued that in their undergraduate degree. So they're doing a biochemistry degree, but somebody forced them to do a Russian lit course in the first year, and they actually kind of found that they liked it. And they took two more Russian lit courses, knowing full well that they weren't going to get any better than a B plus because it's way outside their wheelhouse, but they actually really enjoyed it. If they'd taken biochemistry courses, they probably could have gotten an A, right? But they did what they were, they had that intellectual curiosity. This is where we notice it, right? And this is where it, it, it scores. Okay. Everybody's gonna have a strength. Everybody's gonna have weaknesses. When I think back to myself as a med school application, the scholarship and research thing would have been my weakness. The communities and advocacies would have been my strength. But it takes all types to make a medical school. So the goal here is not to have you try to be all things to all people, but rather to look at yourself with a bit of introspection and say, where are my strengths, where are my weaknesses, and where, you know, where can I, how can I at least show that I have some modicum of all these things? But you don't have to hit it out of the park in all seven domains, okay? Oh, the other caveat, and I get this every year from people who've applied, re applied repeatedly. So they, when you apply at the end of the cycle, you get to see your score. You gotta remember that these scores are just a composite of what four people thought of your application. That is an inherently subjective process. 
So there is some relationship between how you score in year one and how you score the second year when you apply or the year after that. But it's by no means perfect. So when people come back and say, oh, well, last year I scored at the 80th percentile, and this year I scored at the 35th percentile, I'm like, yep. That is, unfortunately, the subjective nature of the, the game that we play. And I think it is important to keep in mind that when you score at the 80th percentile, that's not some kind of institutional stamp of approval that says you are amongst the best of the best. It's, this is what four people reading your files thought this year. Right? And there can be swings from year to year. So be prepared for that. Right? This is the cost we pay as an institution, this, this variability and this reliance on subjectivity is what allows us to have a system that doesn't rely strictly on grades. Right? Because the alternative to that is to say, we're just going to use the MCAT. We're just going to take the 155 people who have the highest MCAT scores. And we think, we've never done it, so we don't know, but we think that would make us a poorer medical school. But the cost is that there is that subjective piece, and that is frustrating for applicants. Okay? So when you see those scores, they are not a judgment on you. They are a reflection of what four individual people thought at a moment in time. All right, so when you're picking a top 10, think about what makes you tick. What matters to you? What is going to give your file reviewers a sense of who you are and what you care about? Some things are obvious, right? It's a no-brainer, right? You were president of the student body or something, or you were captain of this team, or you've been, you know, done your grade 12 piano and been a concert pianist. Yeah, sure, right? Some people, though, go for somewhat more abstract things. My commitment to international development, my commitment to women's health, um, my commitment to my immigrant, you know, my immigrant community. And then you can go even more abstract. So, not even abstract, but but more uh, personal. So some people will reflect on uh, growing up on a farm, right? Growing up poor, um, the death of my sister, right? Those are, you know, some of them are fairly dramatic, right? And all of those things are okay, and some, most people will have a mix of all those sorts of things. The one thing I would caution you against is that things like growing up on a farm, growing up, you know, having a sibling, becoming a parent, whatnot, yes, they're very impactful. They affect who you are. Um, they go a lot to how, you know, what makes you tick. At the end of the day, though, you are trying to distinguish yourself from 1,600 other people who are quite accomplished, right, and quite bright. And so if all of your top 10 are like growing up on a farm, having a sister, losing my dog, getting married, having my first child. At the end of the day, you, your assessor might look at that and say, well, that's very interesting, you're very reflective, you're very mature, I really like what you're saying, but you're really just nobody, no different than every other person who's lived, right? And so you do want to balance that reflective ability and that ref those reflective things with some demonstration that there's something a little bit special about you, right? Show it, and everybody has something about them that's a little bit special. Share that with us, okay? Um, there we go. So choosing a reference. People ask us about this all the time. Remember there are three reference letters who, that are used to assess different things. When we look at the reference letters, your file reviewer can see the identity of your referee if they want to go look for it. But when they actually open the letter of reference, it doesn't have the letter of reference writer's identity on the form. The upshot of that is that it matters much more what your letter of reference writer says about you and how well they know you than who they are. Okay. A lot of people think that professors, particularly medicine professors, will necessarily make better references. And I will tell you that most of the time, letters of references from professors 
primarily say this person's really smart. But guess what? We already know how smart you are because we have your transcripts and we have your MCATs. So it hasn't really, it's not harmful, but it hasn't really added much to the conversation. So professors can be great as references if they actually know you. But if primarily what they're going to tell us is that you came in second in their class of 162 students and did a really good project, they're not adding much to the conversation. You might be better to ask the TA who actually worked with you in small groups and can comment on your ability to collaborate with the other members of the group and the leadership role that you took when things started to go off the rails or you know, your insightful questioning of the other members of the group or whatever it is. That TA might actually be a better, better reference for you. We don't really care how many letters the person in your, who's being your reference has after their name or what their title is. Okay? Similarly, people will often go, to, if they are volunteered at large organizations, like the Red Cross is, is, is a frequent culprit in my mind, um, they will go to the volunteer coordinator at the Red Cross, who actually doesn't know them, right? Because there's this person up here, they have all their different branches, you work within a branch. The letter actually gets generated in some of these organizations as a matter of rote, like it's a little formula, you know, that says, this person's contributed this many hours, they worked in this environment, they did this. It actually doesn't say much about you at all. We actually got, we actually had one of our file reviewers flag it as a possible forgery on a couple of occasions because the letters were so similar. So you might be better to just choose the person who worked immediately above you than the person at the top of the pecking order. Right? One thing that I think is very clear is that when you're choosing a letter of reference writer, you want it to be somebody who can speak to who you are, who knows you, who's had significant interaction with you, and think about in the domain that that letter is primarily about, right? Whether it's advocacy or, or what have you. But don't pick somebody who's too close to you that it compromises their credibility. So the credibility test that I would apply to a letter of reference writer is that if you were a complete piece of work, right, would they tell us? And if they're too close to you to tell us that you are a major personality disorder, then they're not a good letter of reference writer. So when the letter of reference re starts out with, I have been best friends with Bob's mom since he was 12. I'm done, right? Because what, what are they going to tell me, right? You could have a criminal record and they wouldn't tell me because they're best friends with your mom, right? Similarly, family members, second degree relatives, that kind of thing, or peers, right? If your supervisor in a job is actually your roommate, don't use them. Find somebody else. Right? And we get these letters every year. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them, but basically, you might, they might as well not even submit the letter. It's not that it's going to cost you anything, but you lose the input from that letter because nobody's really paying it any attention. Okay? Does that make sense? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, transcripts. I'll deal with that. Should have taken that September 1st thing. Uh, so transcripts. We need original transcripts. People say, "Well, why can't I just use your? Why can't you just use my transcripts from last year?" Uh, because for all we know, you have in the interim gone back to that school and been suspended for cheating. And we need to see the transcripts, right? We need to see what has changed in the year. We can't just assume that nothing else has transpired in that intervening year. So every year we need new transcripts. They have to be sent as originals. Some of you who have already applied may have noticed that your transcripts haven't shown up as received yet. We've got a huge backlog. We've had some staffing changes in the office. We just have not been able to get on top of it. We're hoping in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to play catch up with that. We've actually got somebody coming in tomorrow to start. Um, you will see once they are received and we've had a chance to go through them all, the stack's about this high right now, uh, once we've had a chance to go through them all, they will pop up in UCAN as received. OK? 
right? If you haven't seen them as received within like 10 days of the deadline, I would strongly recommend that you order another copy and have them sent by courier. If they are not in our hot little hands on October 1st, they are not in, you are not an applicant. Okay, so when I look at our statistics, I, people who have not got their transcripts here on time, I don't even count them as applicants. Okay, it's a completely non-negotiable. We say, well, you know, I got this thing here and it says it was received on October 2nd. Yep, but not October 1st. And if we don't have a firm, hard deadline, we have no deadline at all. Right, because if we're gonna accept October 2nd, then we should really accept the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and so on and so on, right? So that is an absolutely unmovable deadline. Is that fair? April's like, yes. And you will run into the stone wall um, that is April if you call and try and complain about that after the fact, okay? All right, um, international transcripts have to be evaluated. We cannot um, evaluate transcripts from, you know, African universities and Middle Eastern universities and European schools that don't actually assign grades and just tell you you're very good at the end of seven years. We can't, we have no process for that. We have to rely on an external body for that. The body we have chosen is World Educational Services. Yes, we realize that that implies an added cost for you and that you have to pay for that service. You can use West reports from previous years. You can reuse them, right, if the transcript hasn't changed, right? So you only have to do it once. You don't have to do it every year. And then we get the transcript from West, right? Yeah, they have to release them to us. Right, and so April is just going to say you have to release them through West to us, okay? And we realize it's a bit of a pain. Um, if it's just one semester, like you went abroad, you went to the university, you went to Sydney or Cambridge or something for a semester, you can use this foreigncredits.com uh, and it's a little free online service and it just transfers, it just tra gives us translation grades, okay? But for more than a semester, you actually have to get a West report. Yes? The U.S., is the U.S. considered international? No. They don't consider us international. They consider us largely domestic, actually, yeah. So about the West transcript, so I think my understanding, April, correct me if I'm wrong, do you want to take the mic here for a minute? Oh, so if uh, they go through West, they just need to send us the West transcript, not the transcript from the school directly, is that correct? That is correct, because the West report includes the transcript, actually, okay? All right, any other questions about that? It's a pain, we're sorry. All right, so a couple little minor changes to the process this year. So uh, those of you who have done this before know that we didn't used to accept graduate grades if the degree was not yet conferred. So this year we do. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, you can delete that line. Delete the line about the September 1st deadline. We used to have a rule that said if you could prove that your transcripts were ordered before September 1st, we would accept them regardless of when they arrived. Um, that created too many headaches for us, so we're no longer doing that. They just have to be here. Okay? It's too easy to doctor screenshots and stuff showing that you did something that you didn't do, as we have sadly uh, discovered. Um, okay, so graduate degrees, uh, you can use them if they're in progress and going to be complete by the end of the year. Again, we reserve the right to go back and back calculate your GPA if, in fact, you don't get the degree. So we'll come looking for a copy of it um, at, the end of the, at the end of the cycle. And if you can't provide it, you could lose your spot. Or you might not, right? It might change your GPA and we still go, yep, yeah, you still got it. Okay, no problem. Um, and then the CARS minimum for non-Albertans, and I'm saying that not for any of you, but for the people who are listening on the podcast, this year has gone up to 128. 127 was an experiment last year. We expect the numbers to go up this year, so, so has the cutoff. Okay. All right, so uh, a few common questions, and I'm going to take your questions for half an hour or so. Um, so we do a thing called score standardization, and people often ask what that means. And they say, well, I got 106 on my advocacy score, so what does that mean? 
Uh, so basically, the way it works is that when we say something contributes about, you know, contributes 10% or 20%, we can't just plunk your GPA into it because all the GPAs range from 3.2 to 4. Right? And so if we just plunked in 3.6 or 3.7 into the formula, it, it, it wouldn't actually contribute 20% because the range is really small. And so basically what we do is we calculate a standardized score based on the mean of the entire pool and how far off of that mean you are based on number of standard deviations. So if the mean is 3.5 and a standard deviation is 0.2 and you're a 3.7, you get 115 by definition. 100 is mean by definition for that year's applicant pool. And each standard deviation is 15. So if you're one standard deviation above, you're 115. If you're two standard deviations above, you're 130. IQ, work, IQ tests work the same way, right? So 140 is genius because it's almost three standard deviations above the mean for the population, okay? So most scores will range from somewhere in the sort of high 60s, low 70s to somewhere around 135 or so. GPA, because it has a hard cap on it at four, and the whole curve of all the distribution of the scores is shifted towards the high end, I think the highest GPA last year was about 118 or 119 or something like that. Because the standard deviation is really, really small. And the mean is high. So this is basically how it works. So anybody, any of you have done any basic stats have seen this sort of graph before, but what it, what it winds up is that two-thirds of the people get between 85 and 115. And then as we get further and further out, the tails get smaller and smaller. So when you get your score reports back, you'll get, I got, you know, my GPA was 112. And then that'll tell you that puts you at the X percentile. Okay? But it's not out of anything. Right? It's not out of 100 or out of 200. Okay? So here's an example, for instance, of the distributions from our ver verbal reasoning from a couple of years ago, right? So we look at all that. So, you know, we had a couple of people who got 15s. We had one person who got a 5 and everything in between. So the mean wound up being 9.74. The standard deviation was 1.5. So if you were an 11, you were slightly below 115. And so everybody had a, you know, so everybody who had an 11 had the same score, everybody who had a 12 had the same score, everybody who had a 13 had the same score. And those will change from year to year depending on the applicant pool, right? So this year, for instance, when we move the cars cut off to 128, we will probably shift the curve for the cars distributions. Because we kicked out a whole bunch of people with 127s who are no longer eligible to apply. So we probably shifted the curve up. All right, so are the application criteria rigid? Absolutely, right? Every year we have 30, 40 people, 50 people who apply thinking that, well, I'm really great in other areas, so maybe that'll just over, you know, they'll, they'll just, over, that'll overcome the fact that I didn't quite make the GPA requirement. The reality is we don't even look at the applications that don't meet the criteria, right? We go through, we find them, we change their status to did not meet eligibility criteria and we never look at them again. Nobody ever even opens them, okay? So don't waste your money, don't waste your time. If your GPA is 3.1949, it is 3.19 and we will not look at your application. No matter how much we might like to, how much we think you're awesome, um, there's nothing we can do about that. Okay? People often ask this sort of a question. What are my chances? Well, this is last year's data, so I actually just crunched this this afternoon for everybody's benefit. So you can see, this is the thing that people gauge themselves on, right? Everybody knows what their GPA is. The higher your GPA, the better your chance of getting in. Right? There were, this is about 1,300 applicants, 1,250, 1,300 applicants, something like that. Um, 
This is the aberration, the 4.0s. There were 56 of them. Of those 56, 28 got in at the end of the day. Right? So that's a small group up there. But you can see the trend quite clearly. The higher your GPA, the better your odds. Down at 3.2, 3.3, yes, we do pluck the odd person out of that pool and say, look, there's something really awesome about this person. We want this person. Maybe they have really good MCAT scores to boot, right? So it balances things out a little bit. Um, but the odds are against you. Below 3.3, 2%. Okay. It's a small applicant pool as well. That was one person out of, well, about 50, right? Similarly, the next one was two people out of about 50. By the time you get up to around 3.7, you're getting into that range where you have about as good a chance as anybody. All comers across the spectrum, it was about 18% last year, got in, okay? So if your GPA is 3.6 or under, yes, by all means, apply, but know that it is going to be an uphill fight for you. Okay? And those numbers are not getting better. I don't want to be Mr. Doom and Gloom, but I think you're entitled to see this data. So I looked at this again today. So we have data in UCAN now going back to 2010, so we can pull it quite easily. This is our percentage of applicants who actually got interviewed, and I apologize for the blue on black. It's a terrible idea. Um, but just looking at it, so back in 2010, we interviewed almost 60% of all applicants. That went down and down and down and down steadily to 2015 when we interviewed about a third of the applicants. It went up a little bit last year. We think primarily because our applicant pool size shrunk because we were requiring the 2015 MCAT. And since a lot of schools didn't require the 2015 MCAT, I think there were a number of people who just decided not to bother applying here. So our applicant numbers went down by about two or 300. Of course, our class size stays the same. Our interview numbers stayed the same, so the chance of getting in actually went up last year. It was a good year to be an applicant. Okay? I expect that to drop again this year. Similarly, if you look at the percentage of people who got accepted, that has also dropped. Now, there's two things at play here. One is that the applicant pool is growing by about 200 people a year. We don't, we have, so far, 26 people have applied, um, but I know that's going to go up. Um, the applicant pool has, in, has, has increased, and our school, for whatever reason, has become a little bit more popular, right? So of the people that we offer, a greater percentage of them are accepting our offers. So seven or eight years ago, we were losing large, larger swaths of the people we offered were choosing to go elsewhere. So there's two dynamics at play here, but I think you're going to see a similar pattern at most medical schools. The upshot of this is this question, right, where people say, well, should I even bothering applying if blah, blah, blah. Yes, I think you should bother applying. It's a great career. I love it. I highly recommend medicine as a career. But you also have to be realistic, right? You're, you have to have a plan B. You have to have something else that you will do if medical school doesn't happen. And your plan B has to be something more than, I will go back to school and do more school and keep applying. What I generally say to people is that if you really are committed to going to medical school, I would apply five times. Be prepared to apply five times, five years running, and to spend the intervening time doing something that is useful to you, valuable to you in its own right, but maybe moves forward your goals of getting into medical school a little bit, okay? That doesn't mean do a grad degree just so that you can get into medical school, but doing something, pursuing some other passion, some other interest, some other alternative career, right? I mean, you can apply from any alternative career. We know there's enough subjectivity in the process. There's enough of a built-in randomness in the process. You have a good interview day, you have a bad interview day, that kind of, you ask, get asked funny questions that you didn't understand, you get asked questions that you hit out of the park. There's enough randomness to it that there is going to be some component of chance. But if you've applied five times and still haven't gotten in, or worse yet, applied five times and still haven't gotten in an interview, 
then the probabilities of you getting in the next time start to fall off quite significantly. Okay? But don't apply once and think, oh, I didn't get in, it's not for me. Our classes are full of people who have applied multiple times. Yeah? So the question is, what are we looking for in that part of the application that says, what is your plan B? Um, so I don't know. That's a funny little legacy question that has been on the application for like 20 years. And I don't know if it was originally put there to just see if you were really, you know, if you had resolve and you were, you were truly committed, you know? I, I don't know. We probably could get rid of the question, honestly. It's just one of those things that's just built into the software now. I think just be honest. Tell people what, you know, What's that? Yes, reviewers have access to that question. Reviewers have access to pretty much everything. They don't have access to your supplemental graduate form where you say what you're, you know, what you're going to do with your grad degree if you get in, if you haven't finished your grad degree. Um, pretty much everything else. No. Am I not worried about how they're going to interpret this information? I'm absolutely not worried about it. Because, in fact, our whole application process is built on this premise of trying to contextualize you as a person and to allow you the opportunity to contextualize yourself for the reviewer, right? So the, actually, the only thing that actually the reviewers, so if it's a matter related to a physical disability, and we that your reviewers are not entitled to. And that we will, we will hide from your reviewers. Uh, but everything else, yeah, I want them to see it. Absolutely. Okay? All right. Um, so this is just another one of these sort of how do I compare graphs. So there's our GPA distribution from last year. So that's the entire applicant pool. So you can find yourself on there roughly and see how big your bar is. But you can sort of see how the entire curve is kind of shifted to the right, right? It's kind of pushed over to the right. Okay? And there's the same one for the cars. And again, I expect that will probably shift over a little bit to the right with the change in the cutoff for the out-of-province people. Right? So if you're at the bottom end of the GPA thing and the bottom end of the cars thing, it's okay, apply for sure, but know that it's an uphill battle, right? And know that you want to get everything, all your other ducks in a row, get everything else in place, right? It is going to be an uphill battle. Not to say it's never happened before. We have very good medical students who've fallen into that. Some of our favorite medical students actually have fallen into that category, okay? And then there's the total MCAT. This is the entire applicant pool. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is that when I look at the means and the standard deviations for the accepted cohort and the applicant pool generally, there's not a huge difference. The GPAs are, the GPAs are almost no different, and the MCATs are a little higher in the accepted pool um, than in the application pool generally, but not by as much as you would think. Because I think what actually happens is that in our process, your GPA and your MCAT gets you an interview. And the interview being worth 50% in a smaller group of applicants basically just overwhelms the file review in terms of being a determinant of who actually gets in. Right? You can go from worst, not quite worst to first, but you know, worst to 100th on the strength of a good interview. And when I say worst, I mean the last person to get an interview, not the worst of 1,600. Um, OK, I uh, just wanted to review this. this. We brought this in last year, uh, our definition of Albertans. And this is primarily I'm doing this for the podcast. So yes, we realize that this is not the definition that the University of Calgary uses. This is not the definition that Revenue Canada uses. Uh, it's not the definition that Alberta Health uses for what constitutes an Alberta resident. It is, however, the definition that we use. And the point here is simply that 
for people to get the advantage of being considered an Albertan, we want to see a meaningful residential commitment to the province, right? We want to know that it is reasonably likely that you have some roots in the province that actually matter. And we were seeing far too many people who were coming out here for five or six months applying and then you know, calling themselves an Albertan. And technically, in our old definition, they were, and then taking off. Okay? The other thing that's worth noting is that this is based on where you live, not where your parents live. Right? We consider you to be in, you know, this is graduate school. It's not technically graduate school, but this is a postgraduate or post undergraduate degree. We consider you to be independent adults. So if your parents moved to Alberta while you went to university at Queen's and you're still at Queen's, the fact that you come home in the summers to your parents' house and the fact that you file your taxes at your parents' address doesn't make you an Albertan in our book. Okay? It's about where you live and where you are physically present on a day-to-day -day basis. If there are questions, usually it's obvious that you are physically present based on your letters of reference and your activities and stuff. If it is not obvious to us, we will ask you for proof. And we might get so granular as to ask you for your cell phone records. Right? Where were you physically when you were making these calls on a day-to-day -day basis? Where are you buying groceries? It is not about where do you have a lease, where is your driver's license, where is your health card. Sad to say, but we've had lots of people over the years who have come here, taken out a lease, paid rent to create the impression that they lived here when, in fact, they lived in another province. Okay? So it's, it's really about the day-to-day -day stuff. And if you tell us that you're an Albertan and we find out that you're not, your application is closed. And that information will, in fact, be taken forward into every subsequent application cycle till the end of time. Right? So you're essentially eliminating your chances of ever getting into our medical school. Don't want to be a doom and gloom, but I think I need to be clear about that. Yeah? Twenty-four consecutive months, yes, but any point between your 15th birthday. And so for a lot of people, what that means is grade 11 and 12, right, um, does it. Uh, but it can be, you know, you lived here, you know, left here a couple of years, you know, came here for university, stayed during the summers, hunkered down for two years, three years, and then gone on elsewhere, then, yeah, we would still consider you an Albertan. But it's, it's, the, it's the year-round bit, right? It's, it's about, not just about where you go to school, it's about where you, where you are in the summer. Okay, um, and this is the transferability standard that somebody, was, uh, somebody over here was asking about. So, this is the standard that we use. So for courses to count, they have to be taken at or transferable to an MD, PhD granting university. So, the problem that we have is that we have to ensure that the courses that we use to calculate people's GPA meet a certain standard of academic rigor. There are all sorts of dodgy universities out there. Um, there are also places that are not universities where we definitely want to be open to accepting students from, right? So if you did your undergraduate work at Medicine Hat College or SAIT or, uh, you know, any number of other places, and SAIT's got to be a little careful with, right? And April's giving me the giving me the look there, careful. Um, but if you did your, your undergraduate work there and you carefully chose your courses, to choose courses that were, that were university level and transferable courses, we don't want to penalize you for the fact that you may have had other things going on that required you to stay at home in Medicine Hat rather than move to Calgary and Edmonton. It shouldn't be a requirement of going to medical school that you have to be able to leave home and move to a big urban center. So that's where we're coming from. So we want to have that transferability. But at the same time, there are all sorts of dodgy universities out there that are diploma mills. And we don't want to be obligated to accept courses from every single university on the face of the planet. So since we need a transferability standard, 
that is worldwide, because our applicants come from all over the world, this is what we've chosen, the MD PhD granting university. So what that means in Canada, is there's 14 of them, or 17 of them, I guess, uh, that grant both MDs and PhDs. Has to be both. That said, there are other universities that we are not the least bit concerned about. York, University of Victoria, Grant McEwen, Mount Royal, University of Lethbridge. I could go on, right? We are not worried about those schools. It is incumbent upon the applicant to establish and convince themselves that their courses are transferable to an MD, PhD granting university. We don't require you to prove it in the application or provide any documentation of it, but if we have concerns, which usually comes up at the point of the file review when reviewers are looking through it and going, I'm not so sure about this place, I'm not so sure about these courses, um, we will come to you and say, hey, we're not sure about transferability here. What, you know, what school are these courses transferable to? This is very explicitly not an exclusionary policy. It is an inclusionary policy, right? We are doing this so that we can cast as wide a net as possible in terms of where you can do your undergraduate work and still welcome you to medical school while just providing us with a little bit of protection against diploma mill universities. Okay? Yes, in the back. So the question was, do we, allow, do we have the file reviewers see the actual scanned copy of the transcripts in addition to what you put into UCAN? And the answer is yes. In fact, that delays our process by about three weeks. But the problem is that when you put a course, you put a course into UCAN, we don't see level, and we don't see the details of what it, the course is, right? We just see discipline and grade and academic year. So you could fill up, you know, you could be doing a whole bunch of first year courses or a whole bunch of fourth year courses, we couldn't tell the difference. So the reviewers have to see the transcripts themselves. Okay? Yes? Uh, yeah, so the question is, is there a way that we discriminate between more prestigious and less prestigious universities? And I will be the first to say that that is a can of worms that we are not going to open. Um, it is intense. What's that? Yeah, so, you know, on the, on the subjective review side, um, again, it's, it's about context. Uh, you know, we do caution our reviewers against getting too far into that because a lot of that is very perceptual, right, in, in terms of, you know, I, I perceive that Princeton is definitely better than the University of Calgary. I don't know, can you quantify that? Can you tell me what an A at the University of Calgary is worth at Princeton? Um, you know, the Ivy League itself in the U.S. has been having, has had huge problems with grade inflation. Um, when you pay $40,000 a year to go to school, you are entitled to a B plus, um, at least. Um, and, in, you know, in fact, we got, we got mail outs from Princeton a few years ago sort of trying to make the arguments that we don't do grade inflation because people were actually starting to um, were actually starting to view negatively grades from the Ivy League schools. They sort of saying, oh, well, it's an A from Harvard, but, you know, it's Harvard, right? A little dodgy, because they have so much grade inflation. So, you know, there, there's a lot of perceptual stuff there uh, that we have to be very careful about. Um, you know, there's good education available in lots of different places. Uh, for lots of different people. So, yeah, we don't, uh, we try not to mess, mess around with that too much. That said, I will say that, you know, if you, um, if you're a C student at the University of Alberta, and then you do a bunch of distance education, and you suddenly turn into an A student, that will get people's attention. Right? And they will, I'm sure, not see those A's in quite the same light as they might otherwise. So there's, you know, there's a bit of subjectivity. We do try to, we do try to rein it in. And similarly, you know, it's, it's, 
not just educational institution. And people have said, well, why don't you, you know, standardize and try to, you know, correct GPAs for instance? You know, it, it's a nightmare to do that for one thing, um, like impossible. Uh, and then even within institutions, there's programs, right? So some programs are more rigorous than others. Um, and then people have all their weird preconceptions about which programs are more are more difficult, right? What's 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 harder, English literature or biochemistry? I don't know, because it depends who you are, right? I took the biochemistry person and put them in an English literature class, they're probably gonna do worse, right? I, you know, so it, it becomes unoperationalizable. The other place, the only place that, the other place that we do, I think it does play in though a little bit in the subjective review is for schools that put, and U of T does this, um, that put class average grades on the transcript. So at U of T, you actually see that you know you got an A and the class average was a B plus versus you got an A and the class average was a C minus, and I think that definitely um, plays into the subjective piece for people. And there, we're seeing more and more schools that are doing that, but beyond that, yeah, we we tread very carefully. All right, anybody else? Yeah. Yep, you telling me now? <laughs> uh, so the question is, if, uh, if you're an employee of the School of Medicine, you just need to let us know. Just send us an email. You can send it to April um, or to the UC Med app, although that email's been having a few problems lately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at some point in the process, get the message to us. We are primarily worried about mitigating conflict of interest for people that are, and we're actually going to change the, the thing next year, I think, it's to people who are employed by the undergraduate medical education program within the medical school, uh, because we're getting all these emails from people saying, oh, I work in so-and-so's lab. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what, I, what I don't want, you know, what I would need to know is if you, you know, you work on maintaining the exam bank questions for the medical school, right? That's what we need to know, because we need to cut off your access before you get too far into the process. So, so we've, we kind of overreached with that a little bit and we'll dial it back next year. So I wouldn't lose any sleep over it unless you know the questions. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then just a couple words about this. So we have this thing now where, again, you'll notice a bit of a pattern. The committee is very concerned with equity and access. Um, and we recognize that in rare circumstances, there are people who, for reasons that are entirely outside of their control, have been unable to pursue school on a full-time basis. And the feeling is that there still has to be a route to medical school for those people of some kind. What we're talking about here is not I was on the varsity whatever team and I chose to only take three courses a semester because it was too hard to balance my athletics and my academics. What we're talking about here is I was a single mom raising two kids and working full time. I couldn't take four courses at a time. I could only take two or three. Right? We're, the bar for this is very high. I had a physical disability that prevented me from attending school full time. But now something is different and I now can attend school full time, right? That's gotta be the other part of it. Those people can actually petition the committee for permission to apply even without full time years. The deadline for doing that is passed, so I'm more saying this for future reference for people who might be listening to this down the road. When we evaluate those applications or those petitions, it really is about two things. It's about, is there other really good evidence that you're super strong academically and maybe stronger than the minimum, right? Um, and was this truly something that was completely beyond your control that you couldn't do anything? It's not a choice. It was a requirement. Right? And again, it's an equity thing. Okay. And then lastly, we have this alternative admissions process. So what this means 
is so we have a process in our application where we call it a, an area of concern. It colloquially gets called a red flag, right? So if something happens or we see something in your application that makes us think that no matter how good your scores are, there's something wrong with you that we do not want you in medical school, we reserve the right to say thanks but no thanks, right? One of your, your transcripts says you were suspended for cheating, uh, you have a criminal record for assaulting your partner, um, you know, big things, right? You've been incarcerated for a year for dealing meth, big stuff, right? I don't care how good your GPA is or how high your MCATs are, there's no place for you here. And so that's been the case for a long time. And we kind of flipped that on its head and said, there are also applicants who are so exceptional in one or two particular domains. Their GPAs are okay, their MCATs are okay, their interviews may be okay. Passes the bar, sufficient, but there's something or one or two or three things about them that are truly exceptional, that they will bring something to the medical school that is somewhat unique, that will help the medical school meet its social accountability mandate, its mission, right? We have an obligation to train physicians for the population of Alberta. They're gonna do something that's gonna allow us to train a better, more effective cohort of physicians. We reserve the right to admit them even if their admission score, their final admission score, doesn't quite meet the threshold, the minimum threshold for the last person to get other, otherwise get an offer. We're not talking about a large number of people. Last year there were three people admitted using this process. Everybody else goes by their score, okay? There were actually three people admitted. There was a fourth one who got flagged who got in anyway, so it didn't matter, okay? You can think of this as a white flag. What's interesting about this is, if this is you, if you become one of these people, you will never know, okay? Unless you take my job someday and dig back down through the database and find yourself. But you will otherwise never know that this was you. The point being that it's not about your score and it's not a quota thing, you are the person we want, right? What's that? Uh, so the question was, what were some of the extraordinary things that these people brought to the table? So I, I'm not, I can't really say, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna divulge people's stories either. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the, the standard that is used is to say, these people brought something to the table, contributed something that allowed the faculty, allows the faculty of medicine to meet its social accountability mandate. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is this an academic or a social issues thing? So uh, it's, um, it might be a combination of both, but it's not going to be purely academic, right? Because there's too many people at the top end of the scale for it to be academic, right? We've got 54 people or 56 people with 4.0 GPAs and an even number of, an equal number of them who've got MCATs that are off the charts, right? So, no, it's about, it's about the social mandate. Okay? All right. And that's, and that's what I said, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's about individual skill sets, right? And you're putting a team together, um, you want somebody who is an exceptional goalie. And they may not be a great skater, they're an okay skater, but they've got really quick hands. You want that person on your team. Same idea, right? We are training, you know, and, and it, part of what it is really comes down to, too, is this notion that we are training a class of physicians to do a job, not picking a whole bunch of individual people, right? We are populating a profession. And so we have to think about what the makeup of the class is, not just what the credentials of each individual member is. And the class is bigger than the sum of its parts. Okay, so that's it. I have a few minutes if anybody else has questions. Yeah, why don't we do that? Why don't we just pass the mic around and then you're, and then you're mic'd.
Hello? Hello. So with regard to your references, if you're unable to contact them, will you contact us? Do you mean the verif? Yeah, the verifiers. Yeah, Sorry. so if something is wrong with the verifiers, we will contact you. And it's, and it's no harm, no foul, right? Like people worry about, oh my god, what if my, you know, what if my verifier says they've never heard of me? You know, am I done? No, you're not done. We'll call you and say, hey, your verifier says you never heard of you. Want to try again? <laughs> right? And, and you'll give us, you'll go, oh yeah, that was a mistake. And you'll give us somebody else. Right? And, and that's fine. And if you put yourself down as a verifier and we're unsatisfied with that, we'll just call you and ask you to give us somebody else. Yeah? For our top 10 statements, is it okay to have something that's, let's say, a decade old? Sure. If it's impactful, right? I mean, you don't want to be reaching too far. You know, so if you're in grad school and you're reaching back into grade 11, it you know, makes people sort of look and go, well, have you know, we not done anything that's sort of a continuation of that since? But no, absolutely. Yeah? If you happen to be self-employed, can you use a client as a verifier? Um, interesting question. I would... Just be careful that there's not a power dynamic there, right? Like that that person's not beholden to you. So, so you, you know, if you're self-employed, maybe you could use a supplier, right? Uh, or a coworker or something. But um, using a client, then you sort of, you know, I, it, it depends on what your self-employment is. And if there's any concern that that person is somehow subservient to you or beholden to you, it sort of becomes like the reference letter writer. Um, so if you're, so I, that was several years in the past for me. If it's an old client and there's, they're not beholden to me in any way. Sure. Is that, that's acceptable? Sure. I think in the back, April. And we'll come rack over this side, okay? Um, what if you're employed by your parents? Ah, then put your parents down. <laughs> and you know, and if we're worried about it, we'll call you. Like, really, I think people get really wigged out about this whole verifier thing. Like, put down what makes sense. If we are unsatisfied, we will come look for more information. Right? If your mother's your verifier for eight of your ten top ten, then we'll like, eh, we need more. But, we're, you know, no harm, no foul. We're not going to penalize you for that. Right? The other thing that you should know is we don't deal with the verifier piece until quite a bit later in the process. And I always, I read this pre-med 101 forum, which is quite hilarious, um, because people go on there just, you know, stating how it is. And I'm like, really? You're wrong, but you say it with great confidence. Um, the verifier piece, we don't, do it at, we don't do it early, because there's too many applicants to do it. We don't do it late, because we're too close to the deadline. We do it after interviews, and we do it completely at random. So the fact that your verifier got contacted says nothing about the state of your application. Nothing. You could be heading towards a thank you but no thank you letter. We'll still contact your verifier because the person doing the contacting, who this year will be mostly April, um, doesn't know yet what the numbers are because we haven't run them. But we have to start a bit earlier, and so that's where we do it in the process. Okay. Anybody else? I think there was. Yeah. We'll get to you. I promise. Hi. Hi. Um, will the reference statistics be released for last year's? The what? Sorry. The stats. Yeah. So this was my attempt to sort of throw you a bone a little bit. Um, yes, they will. I just, I just literally haven't had a chance to get to them. Um, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, the other thing I would say is that I'm not sure how helpful they are. Um, they don't change much from year to year. Um, that's why I tried to include the, the new MCAT ones in here, because those are the, new, the ones that are actually new. Um, but yeah, I need, I need like half a day to a full day to sit down and actually crunch the data and put it into some sort of tabulated form. And I'm going to try and do that in the next couple of weeks, but sorry. Hi. 
Um, so you know the section at the end that's like the additional comments? Just if something happened, why, like, let's say your acad an academic year was worse than the others. Um, if that ap academic year was subsequently dropped, like, do you still want us to talk about it? Like, drop from your GPA or? Um, so you can do whatever you want with the extra comment section. That is entirely up to you. And I, you know, uh, I, my job is to explain to you the process, not to advise you on how to complete an application. I have to be really careful about my boundaries around that. Um, that extra comment section is there because people do want to add in stuff. You will notice that it is the only section in the application that doesn't have a word limit, right? And that's intentional, right? So you can talk about whatever you feel is important. What's that? Yeah. I think behind you, April, or is somebody else? No? I haven't read the handbook, um, but I'm not an applicant. Um, I'm the father of... I of figured. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are the reviewers independent, one of the other? Do they know the score that the, or the, I guess, the opinion that the previous one would have... Yeah. No, the allocated? reviewers are all independent of each other. Okay. And do they, if a subsequent application is done in a, in a subsequent year, are the, are the opinions of the previous reviewers revealed to the no. secondary or tertiary years? No. So each application year, it's a good question. So each application year is completely independent of the application year that came before it. Um, so the only people that would even know that you applied previously would be our office staff, and we would have to go look for that information, unless you mention it on your application. Right. Um, the only exception to that is, is if there's been a red flag that's popped up. That carries forward. We con reconsider that the following year. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Good luck with your applications, and uh, you know where to reach us if you need us. Thanks.